Okay, so uh, the first thing is, you know, why are we so interested in the built environment in terms of circular economy? Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, things have changed quite a lot in the built environment over the last um, you know, decades, few decades. So we're moving from a situation where we have sort of a highly durable built environment that, that stays around for a long time, so this picture here, to one where, you know, we're still building to be very durable and to last a long time, but actually we're getting this more rapid circulation of buildings. So they're not actually reaching their utilisation that was expected when they were designed. So with that in mind, it's like, well, how do we sort of reconcile these two things? You have to have, obviously, a, a fit-for-purpose built environment, but then you also want to be able to optimise the, the resources um, within that built environment and address the circular economy objectives. So I'm not going to go through these, so I don't think we've got time, but basically we're doing some things well um, in terms of our performance. We're doing some things, there's uh, room for improvement. Um, and, you know, really, given the first keynote speaker, which is like, how do we decouple economic growth, productivity from the use of resources? And I think fundamentally that's where we try to, we're trying to shift, because actually we're doing okay in terms of uh, resource efficiency, lots of demolition waste, you know, 96, 97% recycling of demolition waste. But, you know, in terms of the uh, decoupling of utilisation of new products and materials versus our need for a new built environment, you know, that isn't so great in terms of what's going back in. So really, just, just to say that, you know, I mean, we've been doing resource efficiency for, for many years. I've personally been looking at resource efficiency in the built environment for many years. And I think that we've sort of pretty much done a lot in that space. So we've captured our knowledge in things like this system here, smart waste system. So we have an environmental reporting um, system that is used by a lot of the main contractors. We've embedded what we think are, are sort of best practices, aspirational targets within our sustainability standard, BREAM. Um, hopefully some people here will have heard of that. So we're sort of trying to make sure we, we embed and we standardise our knowledge wherever possible. Um, and we're also, you know, part of this community which is all about, you know, circular economy, improving the built environment. So we're sort of sharing and contributing in those networks. But the thing I'm going to focus on today is really you know, where do we want to go next in terms of the research and the development? Because we have to get new knowledge to make this uh, circular economy actually applicable and being delivered within the built environment. So this is where I'm really focus we're really focusing on... I don't know if that works. I'm not very good at these things, to be honest, with these gadgets. Um, so we're focusing on these two projects. So BAM, which is Buildings as Material Banks, which I'm going to talk to you about later. And then the other one is actually a project that's about to start where... Um, Elwarb is the UK lead, and it's called Circuit, so it's Circular Construction in Regenerative Cities. That hasn't started yet, could all be derailed by Brexit, we don't know yet, but hopefully it won't be, and we'll be able to sort of transition some of the knowledge we've gained within the BAM project into more of a city-level um, application of those concepts, plus a lot more. So with BAM, obviously the aim was to move from um, a linear built environment to more of a circular built environment. But then how do you do that? I think that's a key thing. So we've been trying to grapple with that for the last I don't know, three and a half years. It's been going since 2015. We've learned a lot, didn't achieve all the things we wanted to achieve, but we've actually moved forward in a lot of areas in terms of um, the aspects of, uh, for example, reversible building design, developed a whole set of um, assessment tools, protocols related to how do you design a new built environment that's going to be adaptable, designed for disassembly? Um, we've been working on, this is part of the BAM project, on material passports. So what's the data that you need to collect at a product level in order to facilitate this, uh, you know, circular economy in the built environment? And it's going, it's got, I don't know, it keeps doing these transitions. I don't know why I'm taking it off. Um, but then really critically, these whole areas of pilots. So we've had six pilots, you know, physical pilots of, you know, really innovative application of circular economy, um, very varied, um, very different pilots. Unfortunately, not in the UK, but, you know, hopefully we'll get there in the circuit project to do that. Um, and then really also very importantly is the whole policies and standards. So how do we build a regulatory framework that's really going to facilitate this quite transformation, the transformations actually needed to really address the circular built environment? 
Um, and the bit that I'm going to focus on here is this bit here, which is about the circular building assessment. So how do you give information in the best form to decision makers across the, the value network, uh, in, particularly in the built environment? And I'm going really fast. It's quite complicated, so you have to apologise if you don't understand. Just ask me later. So really, this is an overall description of what we produce. So we've said, OK, we want to be able to do these forms of assessment. We want to be able to do um, a, an environmental assessment. We want to do an economic assessment. We want to do a social assessment of moving from linear to circular built environment. Right, in order to do that, we need a whole bunch of data. So once we've defined our assessment methodology, we need data in order to do that. So we then on the, this hand side, we've sort of identified some of it's got to come from the user, so they have to put some information in about their project, for example. We can get information from BIM, from building information models. You know, let's use that as our foundation. We can get information from um, like product data, both from the BIM world, but also from material passports. And then we've got a whole bunch of actual, you know, other data sets that could be utilised to create this platform in the middle where you're getting the data and you're acquiring it with the least hassle, the easiest way, and the most robust data. And then it's running through these automated calculations um, in a very user-friendly way. So in order to sort of define our boundaries a bit, we said, well, okay, what are we looking at? We're looking at, um, so for the purpose of BAM, we pinned it down to this three asset or three building life cycle approach. So what can we extract from the existing or previous built environment? It's already there. We can't do much about it in terms of designing for a future and you know, for a different scenario. But what we can do is extract the products and the materials from it. What can we do with the current building, building? So the thing that we're designing today, how do we look at making it adaptable, for example, so you can extend the longevity of that asset? And then what are you doing in terms of the building design today to consider the future built environment, so to create these buildings that are banks for the future? So that's really our sort of three scenarios, like really high-level scenarios. And then um, we're comparing that against a business-as-usual scenario, the linear, built, the, the linear scenario. So we started to, we created our methodology. We started to, you know, to look at different variables in terms of how you could report that back. And then we, we then applied that to real life building situations. So this is just uh, BRE's um, environmental building. So it's 20 years old, but actually it had quite a lot of uh, circular economy type features in it. So use reclaimed bricks, had a bit of lime mortar in it so you could reuse them again in the future. There's, uh, you know, it's quite uh, adaptable. The internal space configuration is quite adapt adaptable. And, you know, we've also got some movable internal systems. So all of these sort of really much, you know, at a very specific level, address these high-level scenarios that we were trying to work out, well, you know, so what? If you do it differently, what difference, what, do you, what are you gaining? Are you gaining? How do you then pin that down? So it's really complicated, but, you know, actually it does end up that you need to start to get down to that level of granularity in terms of, I'm changing this, what does that mean? And this is an environmental uh, calculation that's come out really badly on the screen. Um, but essentially it shows just a really quick one. I'm gonna move over here. That's new bricks, that's reclaimed bricks in terms of um, embodied carbon. So you can already start to see, if you can communicate that information really clearly, you can start to say, well, okay, if you're interested in reducing carbon emissions, Here's a really, well, maybe not easy, but this is a quite high uh, impactful way to actually achieve some of those savings. And if we replicated that up to, from a building to a city, you can start to aggregate some quite significant numbers. So it's all about collecting the data robustly, doing that analysis, and then be able to aggregate it up with a, a level of confidence, and then work out the data that we already have to facilitate that. But where are the gaps? And I mean, th this is where the, you know, the next work on the city scale is going to be really key, is we've got all this information. How do we enable it to communicate with each other? Where are the gaps? How do we best fill those gaps to be multifunctional rather than just addressing one thing and then you know, having somebody else having to do it all over again to do something else? 
So the economic assessment is based on life cycle costing, so what's the, the total cost of the building over its lifetime, which is, you know, actually it works quite well um, within the building lifetime, lifetime, but when you're looking at this three lifetime approach, it doesn't work so well at all and the various accountancy rules didn't work very well. So we've had to try and work out a way to report that, not necessarily in, to in, in economic, strict e economic terms, more in terms of societal value, because otherwise it's very difficult to do it within the current constraints. Um, works really well for um, things that change within the asset lifetime. So this here just gives an indication of different scenarios. So. For example, a reusable partitioning system versus different replaceable partitioning systems. They may start off more expensive, but if you don't have to keep replacing them every 20 years, there's a, there's a very clear threshold where one will become more cost effective than the other. And you'd be surprised to know that actually some of these things aren't thought about in when people are designing buildings. I know it'll be a shock to you all. Um, but let's think about it. Let's really think about how is this asset going to be used? How is it going to be developed over what period of time? And then match the optimal solutions to that. And if it actually generates some thought and discussion about, well, maybe we need to do it a bit differently. Maybe we need to convert this football stadium into, I don't know, you know a luxury hotel in 20 years' time. How are we going to design that in now so that we don't have to knock it all down and start again? So this is really just trying to start to think about you know, making those intelligent decisions up front so that we're not having to keep you know, changing our built environment in such a radical linear cell sense. So this is really just a comparison. So we can start to build up these economic and environmental comparisons quite quickly now because we've created this platform to enable it. And the other thing we we're quite keen to do is not to forget the social side of it, because you know there are benefits, there are also disbenefits benefits to changing from linear to circle. Let's examine them, let's get people in the room and have those discussions. And it's going to be like the building user, the immediate community, society as a whole. Let's just understand what difference it's making to them. So, like for example, jobs is an obvious one. But there could be local impacts of transport where you know you're not having to move so many lorries around that could really help the local community so we actually did it's the first ever like stakeholder type of um, activity in mostar in bosnia that was our pilot effectively for the methodology we created and it was really interesting because just we went there with our preconceptions about because there's a whole green design center that's being developed there and there's a big focus on circular economy so we went there with our preconceptions of why people should want this in their place and we came away with a completely different understanding of why they might want it in their place so you know we I, i'm not suggesting we know it all because i don't think you do but it's like having that dialogue having that that discussion so that you can get people in to understand and when they understand <coughs> they start to input their views and you actually change it and because you're changing it it's actually going to be more fit for purpose it's probably going to last longer and have uh, you know greater functionality as a result of that so this again not <laughs> so this we so we've done a lot of work on structuring data and that's all I'm going to say because it gets quite complicated otherwise so building level space level element level <coughs> material component level and then so these are the different levels, and then down the side are the property sets that we need to run our different assessment methods that I outlined at the beginning. Um, and that's what one of the property sets looks, looks like. So it's about standardizing it so we can speak a common language so that if you collect the data for replacement frequency for, for I don't know, to, to get your FM sorted out, your facilities management contract sorted out, it's the same bit of data that you can then use to do the calculation for the um, life cycle costing of doing this scenario versus that scenario. So if we standardize our data sets, you collect it once and use it, uh, you know, potentially hundreds of times for different applications. So hence, one of the things, the question I was asking Wayne was, let's try and be smart about the data and the platforms that we use, because then you're not asking the manufacturer to create 20 different um, you know, put data, the same data in, but in 20 different ways because everybody's trying to calculate things differently. 
Um, and like I say, Trevor's getting twitchy, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Before I get the red book. Um, so this is just what it actually does exist. So I just want to make so it does exist. This is the CBA platform, um, and um, we've we've done gone a long way. There's still a long way to go, and I think that's the the further development that we need to do. Um, we have got a final event as a band project on the 5th of February in Brussels. So if anybody fancy a trip to you know stock up on chocolate and beer or something <laughs> whilst they're at it, the Eurostar tickets are very cheap at the moment. Peterborough to King's Cross, etc. Uh, all right. So I'm just going to really, I think I'm only on this slide. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot we need to do still, and um, and these are, this is my summary really of some of the things that we still need to do. We may need to make it simpler. We need to make it, you know, part of the decision making process of designing, managing, operating, refurbishing. Um, and for me, like particularly the built environment, but you also need to make the decisions in a certain order. So, for example, transformation capacity, which is the ability to be able to transform the building, either to add capacity or reconfigure the internal space. You need to do that quite early on. You don't want to do it at the end of the design process because you've missed the boat then. Whereas stuff about, well, can I actually replace, you know, I don't know what, this, this product with a different product, you're going to be looking at that more towards you know, your, t your, your technical developed design stage. So it's about having that, um, that really strong support to people that are making those decisions. I think there's a lot that we need to do in the policy space, and there'll be some, uh, there's a report coming out um, where Peterborough is, got, you know, is, is one of the best practices that we've highlighted in there in terms of the work that's going on here. In terms of supporting that that you know that that very friendly policy environment to get this to change, and really just a final plug for the final event in uh, in Brussels in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.